we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book, which is titled 2 Chronicles. And with this as the focus, let's open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. Now, as you make your way to the 16th chapter of 2 Chronicles, I should take, just take a moment to remind you that, that we actually find ourselves in a section of Scripture uh, which is focused on the period of time when the nation of Israel was divided up into two separate kingdoms, which included the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. This all took place after the death of David's son Solomon. And, and this took place as the Lord decided to give control to the northern kingdom of Israel you know, as a punishment to, to Solomon and his descendants because of all of you know, Solomon's sins. And so he, he gave the northern kingdom of Israel into the hands of a man named Jeroboam. And at the same time, the Lord also allowed Solomon's son Rehoboam to retain control over the kingdom of Judah, and this was out of respect for King David. And from the day of Solomon's death and until the time of the Babylonian captivity, the descendants of David's son Solomon continued to serve as the kings of Judah. We see uh, an ongoing progression, you know, from Solomon until Babylon. And this, of course, includes Solomon's great-grandson Asa, uh, who we find here in our text tonight. Remember, it was two weeks ago when we were first introduced to King Asa. And while it's true that Asa was a good king, probably one of the best, uh, and, and he had led the kingdom of Judah into a time of religious revival, and yet it's also true that he ended up allowing his fear of man to keep him from maintaining a completely unwavering reliance upon the Lord. And as a result, uh, the fear of man actually ended up be, uh, becoming a snare uh, to King Asa. And as we make our way through our text tonight, it's my hope that this study will help us to realize that those who are wise in their own eyes will end up making many foolish mistakes. Those who uh, walk in the fear of men will end up in a snare. And those who take their eyes off of Jesus Christ will struggle to finish, uh, to, to, to cross over that finish line of faith. And, and so with that, we need to learn to lean on the Lord. We need to fix our focus on Jesus Christ so that we can receive the divine directions that we need to continue following Christ on this narrow path path of righteousness. And so with this as our goal, let's continue making our way through Ezra's account, which is found here in 2 Chronicles chapter 16. If you would look with me there, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here we learn that in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, uh, that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Uh, now, here in the first verse of this chapter, we we're introduced to this man named Baasha. And according to Ezra, Baasha became the king of Israel during the 36th year of, of King Asa's reign over the southern kingdom of Judah. Or actually, this is, this is when he started coming up against uh, Asa, I should say. And, and Ezra fails to tell us exactly how Baasha uh, came to acquire the throne there in Israel. And with this as the focus, uh, we should take some time to consider the details which are actually found in the book of 1 Kings. If you would hold your place here in 2 Chronicles, Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 15. Now, as you make your way to the 15th chapter of 1 Kings, I just want to take a moment to point out that Baasha is actually a Hebrew word, uh, which uh, it means wicked. Uh, and, and so this guy is named Wicked. Uh, not only that, but the root word actually means stinky and, uh, and, and offensive. And so, you know, it, maybe, maybe he was like one of, the, one of the dwarves, you know, maybe he was stinky dwarf. Uh, we're not really sure why he was called stinky or offensive or, or wicked, but I would imagine that this was a nickname that he possibly picked up along the way, uh, you know, because I, I just have a hard time believing that some parent would, you know, look at their newborn son and think, yeah, he's stinky or, or he's wicked or something like that, right? But maybe, maybe not. Uh, we don't know. But I'm guessing that he probably picked up this nickname along the way, especially after uh, people saw the way that he acquired the throne from Jeroboam's son, Nadab. And with this as the focus, if you would look with me there at 1 Kings uh, chapter 15, I want to begin reading at verse 25, because here we learn that Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel two years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. Then Baasha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha killed him at Gibeathon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibeathon. 
Uh, Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place, and it was so. Uh, when he became king, that he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite, because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned, and by which he had made Israel sin because of his provocation, with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Now, here in these verses, we learn about the way in which Baasha became the king of Israel. It wasn't just passed down to him from his father. No, he took it by force. And that's possibly why he ended up with this nickname, Wicked. Uh, now, now, to sum all this up with simplicity, you should know that Jeroboam's son Nadab took his father's place on the throne, and within two years of that, Baasha conspired against Nadab, killed him, and then claimed his crown for his own. Listen, the Lord allowed this to happen. The Lord allowed this to happen because Jeroboam and Nadab were both sinful men who had encouraged the people of God to worship idols that were made of gold. Therefore, God allowed this wicked man named Baasha to successfully steal the throne uh, from Jeroboam's son, Nadab. And not only that, but it's right here in 1 Kings chapter 15 where we learn that there was constant conflict between the kingdoms of Israel and Judah during the days of Baasha's reign. As a matter of fact, if you would, let's back up in 1 Kings 15. I want to point you back to verse 16. Here we learn that there was war between Asa and Baasha, the king of Israel, all their days. And Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. And so, as we've already seen, this took place in the 36th year of Asa's reign. And from this, we see that Baasha was a wicked king who was constantly causing conflict with King Asa. And after 33 years of constant conflict, we find King Asa, he's, he's finally deciding to deal with the issue, and he, and he dealt with it in a way that was displeasing to the Lord. Now, with this context in mind, let's make our way back to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. I want to pick up our study of 2 Chronicles 16, beginning at verse 2. Here we learn that Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, and there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Uh, now, here in these verses, we find King Asa, he's seeking assistance from the king of Syria. And in order to put, uh, you, know, in, you know, in order to understand the, the logic of his strategy, I should take a moment to point out that Syria is actually located on, on the northeastern border of Israel. And with that being the case, you know, King Asa was asking the king of Syria to create this conflict there at the northern border of Israel so that King Baasha might withdraw his troops from fortifying the border which was there between Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And so Baasha was focusing all of his attention there in the southern region of Israel. And, and you know, you have Asa saying, hey, cause some conflict up in the northern region so that he departs and heads north. With this as the goal, King Asa, he actually took silver and gold, not from his own personal bank account, but from the treasuries of the temple. And he sent these treasures of the Lord to Syria. And in this way, he was creating a treaty with Ben-Hadad. And just as he had hoped, you know, the king of Israel quickly withdrew from Ramah after hearing about the Syrian invasion there on the northeastern border of Israel. Let's consider how Ezra puts it here in Second Chronicles Chapter 16. If you would look with me there at verse 4, here we learn that Ben Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They attacked Ejon, Dan, Abel Man, and uh, all the storage cities of Naphtali. And now it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Baasha had built, uh, used for building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah. And here in these verses, we find King Baasha, he's leading the army of Israel from Ramah, there in the south uh, end of Israel, to the northern tribal territory of Naphtali in order to deal with this Syrian invasion. And it was at this point in time when King Asa took control of the city of Ramah, which is right there on the border uh, that was between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. He took control of Ramah, and it was at that point in time when he started dismantling the border wall that Baasha was building in order to stop the people in the northern kingdom from going down uh, to the temple. Now, without debate, this military strategy of King Asa was pragmatically successful. 
It was pragmatically successful, and there's no doubt that his treaty with the king of Syria it enabled him to, uh, to regain control over the northern border of Judah. Unfortunately for him, though, what Asa was failing to realize was, was that this, this pragmatic solution wasn't the right solution. And, and, and it's important for us to grasp this, that the pragmatic solution isn't always the right solution. You know, he truly believed that he had come up with the best plan for practically dealing with King Baasha, and yet he was simultaneously failing to remember that the ways of the Lord are higher than our ways. And, and, and we can think something through and think, oh yeah, this makes perfect sense. But listen, the ways of the Lord are higher than our ways. Therefore, rather than prayerfully seeking the wisdom of the Lord to guide him in how to deal with this entire situation, King Asa instead decides to rely on his own understanding. And he does this by taking treasures out of the temple and, and, and he uses the, the treasures of the Lord to make this treaty with Ben-Hadad and, and, and without stopping once to just say, okay, God, is this, is this the right plan? Is this your plan, God? No, he just made these decisions. As a result, his treaty with the king of Syria, it resulted in conflict with the king of kings. With this in mind, I'd like you to pick up our study here in 2 Chronicles 16 at verse 7. Here Ezra tells us that it was at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars." Now, here in this, these verses, we find the Lord sending this seer named Hanani to go and rebuke King Asa. You know, the seers, these were, this was another name for a prophet before you know, we had prophets here. They were called seers. And, and the reason for, for why the Lord sent this seer named Hanani to go and rebuke King Asa is because Asa had relied on the king of Syria first rather than relying upon the Lord. Now, it may have been that the Lord would have sent him up to, to go and meet with the king of Syria. Maybe not. We'll never know because Asa simply just made up his own mind. He just kind of made a decision and, and went for it without ever really checking in with the Lord. For the sake of clarity, as we consider the way that he relied on the king of Syria, you should know that, that the word relied, which is found there in verse 7, is translated from a Hebrew word which refers to the confident trust that leads a person to, to depend upon or to, to lean upon those who are deemed to be trustworthy. So he was leaning upon the king of Syria. It's for this reason that Robert Young rendered verse 7 in this way, Hanani the seer come in unto Asa king of Judah and said unto him, because of thy leaning on the king of Aram and thou hast not leaned on Jehovah thy God, therefore hath the force of king Aram escaped from thy hand. In other words, King Asa was leaning on the strength of a Gentile king rather than leaning on the infinite strength of the Lord who had already given him the victory over that massive Ethiopian army that tried to invade the land of Judah. Early on, Asa was leaning on the Lord, but now he's leaning on this Syrian king. And as we consider Asa's decision to lean on the king of Syria, it's important for us to realize that the real root of this issue, it wasn't about the king of Syria. No, instead, King Asa was actually just leaning on his own understanding. He was actually just relying on his own ability to solve his own problem with King Baasha. Or, or more simply put, Asa was leaning on his own rationale. He was leaning on his own thoughts. He was leaning on his own understanding. And, and knowing how common it is for us to lean on our own understanding, we would do well to remember the encouragement of King Solomon. It's actually in Proverbs chapter 3 where we find King Solomon using that same word that's translated relied upon. Uh, here it's translated lean upon. And it's in uh, Proverbs 3 verse 5 where, he, uh, where Solomon says, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. 
Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Christian, listen, before we make the same mistake as King Asa by starting to lean on our own understanding, we would all do well to remember that those who lean on their own understanding oftentimes end up making the wrong treaties with the wrong people. That's what happened with Asa. And there are times when we start trying to make treaties with people and, and God's not leading it and, and it's going to come back to bite us. It's crucial for Christians to remember that the Lord's ways are higher than our ways. And, and while there's a way that might seem right, it might seem rational, it might seem practical and pragmatic, and yet it's still possible that the Lord has a different plan for our lives because he knows the end from the beginning. Therefore, before we move forward with our well-thought-out plan, we would do well to check in with God. We would do well to prayerfully seek the leading of the Lord so that we can receive the divine direction that we need. And as a matter of fact, you might even save some time to just go ahead and start off with that first. Rather than trying to think it all through and then say, God, will you bless my plan? You know, how about just say, God, can you show me your plan? Can you give me the divine direction that you promised to give me? And then move forward accordingly. It'll work out so much better. In order to further grasp the importance of seeking the Lord first, let's consider the point that Hanani the seer was making here in our text tonight. If you would, let's, let's take another look here at 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. Here the seer Hanani declares, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. Now, now as we consider what Hanani was saying here, we see here that the Lord is actually looking for those who want to be loyal to him. He's looking for those who, with all loyalty, will lean on him. The Lord is searching for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord is searching for those who will rely on him with a heart that is completely committed to Christ Jesus. And listen, this is the most rational decision, even when the Lord leads us in a way that seems less than pragmatic. The most rational thing that we can decide is that we are going to seek God first. We're going to seek his kingdom, his righteousness, his direction. We're going to seek him first and allow him to guide us. It's the most rational thing, even when he leads us to do something that seems irrational. Sadly, it's the pride of life that constantly leads us to follow in the foolish footsteps of Asa as we start leaning once again on our own understanding. How many of us, like King Asa, get to a point in our lives where it's just kind of like, I, I got this, God. I'm smart. I can think it through. I got a, a degree at the University of Phoenix. I know what I'm doing. Be careful. We need to Seek God first and allow him to guide us. Because, listen, the foolishness of God is wiser than the smartest man. And yet, those who lean on their own understanding will end up becoming fools here in this world. Just to be clear about this, if you would notice with me again there in Second Chronicles chapter 16, look with me there at the end of verse 9. Here Hanani says, in this you have done foolishly, you know, leaning on king of Syria, in this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars. He, he was trying to avoid this war with Baasha, and so he goes and leans on the king of Syria, and the Lord says through Hanani, you've done foolishly because now you've guaranteed wars for the rest of your life. That word foolishly, it's translated from a Hebrew word which could also be rendered silly, or even stupid. What this means is that it was a silly, stupid, foolish decision for King Asa to rely upon the king of Syria before even checking in with God. And not only that, but it was even more foolish for him to, to reject the rebuke of Hanani because that's what he actually did. As a matter of fact, let's take a minute to consider the way that Asa responds to the Lord's messenger, the seer Hanani. If you would, let's pick up our study of 2 Chronicles 16, there at verse 10. Here we learn that Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. 
Now, on one level, I, I, I have to confess, I get this. I, I understand the anger of Asa, and, and the reason why is because no one likes it when other people question our decisions. No one wants their, their decisions to be questioned, let alone accuse us of making silly, stupid decisions. You know, someone comes up to you and says, hey, you know that thing that you decided the other day? That was pretty foolish of you. Would you think, oh, this is my best friend in the world? Or would you become angry with them? Chances are we would become angry with them. And that's what happened with Asa here. He was angry. He was angry because the seer that was sent by God told him that he had made a foolish decision and told him that it's going to result in wars for the rest of his life. So I get it. I, I'm, I'm sure we can all you know, relate with Asa here. At the same time, it's also important for us to understand that foolish decisions become even more foolishness whenever we dig in our heels and reject the spiritual leaders that the Lord uses to come and correct us. You know, it's one thing to make a foolish decision. We all do it. It's even worse when the Lord sends that leader into your life to say, hey, wake up, <laughs> you're heading down the wrong path, and you go, who are you to tell me? You know, you're not my real dad. You know, and we take this attitude of, you know, who, who made you judge Judy an executioner? You know, who, who gave you the right to come and talk to me? Well, would you be okay if, it, if I said God told me to, to say this to you? Is that okay? No, we get, we get upset because we don't want to be challenged. We don't want to be rebuked, and that's nothing but foolish pride. And so we make a foolish decision and then make an even more, fool, uh, more foolish decision by ignoring the people that God sends into our lives to re, you know, redirect us and correct us. But that's exactly what Asa did here. Rather than receiving the rebuke of the Lord, King Asa instead decided to silence the seer by throwing the prophet of God into prison. Not only that, but he started oppressing the people there in Judah. And if I had to guess which people, well, it's probably the people who were saying, hey, why is Hanani in prison? Why did you throw the prophet of God in prison here? And why is it that you're making these decisions? And chances are there's some people questioning him. And he's like, oh, okay, you're going to question me? I'll oppress you too. And he started just oppressing any person that came up against him. And again, more foolish pride. What this means is that King Asa was not only relying on the king of Syria to protect him, but he was now rejecting the people of God who were challenging him to rethink his whole game plan. Rather than recognizing that he was on the wrong path, King Asa continued to rely upon his own rationale, and as a result, he failed to repent of his foolishness, and things just got worse and worse for him. I can't help but to think about something that King Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 14. It's there where he declares, A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. A wise man fears the Lord, and, and that fear of God depart, uh, leads us to depart from evil. But the foolish person continues to take a stand in self-confidence. The foolish person is filled with the pride of life, which leads them to lean on their own understanding. And it's sad to say that this always results in catastrophe. This was the point that Solomon was making in Proverbs 16 where he says the, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He who keeps his way preserves his soul. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Those who are filled with foolish pride will also struggle to walk in a way that is pleasing to the Lord. And as a result, they begin to stumble and fall. In order to prove my point, I want to consider the way that the foolish pride of King Asa ended up affecting the way that he walked, literally speaking. With this as the focus, let's continue to consider the historic uh, account that's found here in 2 Chronicles 16. If you would look with me there at verse 11. Here Ezra writes, Note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, and in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. They buried him in his own tomb. 
which he had made for himself in the city of David. And they laid him in the bed, which was filled with spices and various ingredients, prepared in mixture of ointments. They made a very great burning for him. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we find Ezra, he's kind of summing up the final years of Asa's life. And while it's true that David's great-great-grandson was a godly king who led the people of Judah into a time of religious revival, it's also true that uh, this king you know, failed to faithfully walk in the Lord. He, he began faithfully walking with the Lord, and he, and he faithfully walked with the Lord for many, many years, but, but he eventually suffered from a malady that kept him from walking at all. And as we consider the point that Ezra was making here, it seems to me that the Lord you know, would have been happy to heal his diseased feet if he would have simply asked. You know, he, he died unable to walk right, because of these diseased feet, and yet he kept going in to see you know, the physician, and he'd go and find whatever physicians he could get his hands on, and none of them could heal him. And Ezra seems to suggest here that had he simply just turned to the Lord and asked, that God would have healed him. And in this, I just see this illustration of the physical problem reflecting the spiritual. He wasn't walking with the Lord right, Spiritually speaking. And so he was unable to walk physically. Now it should be noted that these verses shouldn't be used as a basis for avoiding physicians. If you read these verses and think, you know, oh, it's bad to go see physicians, that's, that's not the point here. That's not the point. At the same time, it would be equally wrong for us to imagine that the Lord will always heal people who will simply pray for healing rather than going to the hospital. My mom got duped into this one. You know, the, the faith healers told her, just, you know, don't go to the physicians, you know, just pray and, and, and God will heal you. And so after getting cancer, she didn't go to the hospital. She prayed and prayed and prayed. She gave her money to all the right places, you know, and, and, and planted her seeds of faith and, and then died of cancer. You know, so, so be careful, you know, that we don't, begin to build false doctrine out of a text like this. This is a historic narrative. We're just learning a story of the things that happened in the life of Asa. And we shouldn't turn around and say that, oh, this is an assembly line normative way, you know, that God deals with everybody. That's not the case. The point that Ezra here is making is this, that King Asa didn't seek the Lord at all. No one said he only trusted in his physicians. And that is a problem. The person who's putting their trust in physicians first, and the Lord maybe, if you get around to it, that's a huge mistake. Christian, listen, there's nothing wrong with relying on skilled physicians if that's what the Lord leads you to do. And while I praise the Lord that he's created us to, to invent incredible ways to heal our bodies, we must not fail to remember that those who are truly trusting in him ought to seek the leading of the Lord first. You know, like, for example, you know, if you are supposed to go see a physician, which one? Might want to pray about that. You know, if, if you have a physician saying one thing, you know, should you go get a, a second opinion? And, and if so, who are you going to go to for that? Might want to pray about that. These are things that we ought to be praying about. We ought to be seeking the leading of the Lord first as we prayerfully make that appointment to see the doctor. In order to further explain my point, I want to consider something that James wrote in his epistle. If you would turn with me to James chapter 5, and as you make your way to the fifth chapter of James, I just want to take a moment to remind you that the Lord has promised to, to save us from this corrupt corpse that we're currently living in. Praise the Lord for that. I don't know, maybe you're completely satisfied with, with you. Uh, I can't wait to get in heaven. I, I can't wait to have a brand new body, I'll tell you that. I'm 51, almost 52. I got 50 itis. And I can't wait for the Lord to heal me of it. <laughs> the Lord has promised to save us from this corrupt corpse. And, and, and he's going to do this by providing us with a brand new body uh, at the time of the resurrection. Until that day, though, we must realize that these bodies have been affected by the curse. And as a result, our bodies are running down. Entropy is happening. And, and it results in sickness and disease and things that don't work right. And 
while we should most certainly seek the help of physicians and medications and these sorts of things, listen, the born-again believer should always begin by seeking the supernatural healing of the Lord first. Let's consider how James puts it here in James chapter 5. I want to focus your attention there at verse 13 where James asks, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now here in these verses, we find James, he's encouraging every sick saint to take the time to first seek out the elders of their church, the leaders at their fellowship, and and to pray for the healing that the Lord is able to provide. And according to James, the prayer of faith, he says, will save the sick. Now, just to be clear, the word save there, it's translated from a Greek word which could refer to supernatural healing, uh, you know, by which a a person's uh, state of health is restored. Uh, But not only that, this is also the word which is used of the salvation that we receive as we're finally raised up with an incorruptible body at the time of the resurrection. Now, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord is able to heal every single one of us of anything that ails us. He is the all-powerful God. And yet at the same time, we can also rejoice in knowing that if God chooses to withhold healing while we're here in this world, he's got his reason for it. And, and, And we can still look forward to the day when he will raise up our corrupt corpse from the grave. And it's at that point in time when this corruption will put on incorruption and this mortal will finally put on immortality forevermore. But until that day, let's avoid the foolish mistake that King Asa made when he decided to go seek the physicians without ever asking the Lord to guide him or lead him or even heal him. We have to pray for healing first. We have to seek the Lord first. We have to ask him to touch us and heal us and and, and make us whole. And if that's his will, he's going to do it. But he might lead us to go seek out this physician or that physician or that medication, or he might lead us in in any number of ways. He might just let us just be done with our race and come home you know, early. That's, that's fine with me too. But listen, if you're sick and you're suffering, call for the leaders of your church to pray for you. I've seen God use this to heal people time and time again. And I've also seen other Christians you know, who, who remain sick. And, and one reason why is because they don't follow what James told us to do. And James says, you have not because you ask not. If you're sick and suffering and you've never asked the leaders of this church to pray for you, huge mistake because God has told you what to do. And so come and ask for the leaders of the church to pray for you. And we'd be happy to anoint you with oil and pray over you and seek the supernatural touch of the Lord. And, and sometimes the Lord uses that to heal people. But we must seek the Lord first and put our trust in physicians as a secondary thing. As we ask the Lord for his healing touch, we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord is either going to restore the health of our mortal body, or, you know, if if he doesn't, well, it's only a matter of time until he provides us with the true salvation of a brand new body, which is free from every disease forevermore. Now, if there is one lesson that we should take away from the entire story of King Asa, it's this. A person can begin their race well, but then end up hobbling over the finish line of faith. That's what happened with Asa. He began well. When his race began and the gun was fired, he took off in a sprint, and he led the children of Israel there in the land of Judah into a time of revival. But then by the end of his life, He could barely walk, both physically and spiritually. And much like Asa, there are Christians who began their walk with the Lord well. They started the race off great, focused faith on Jesus Christ. But then over the years, this hardship rises up, that hardship rises up. You know, the the Lord doesn't always answer every prayer the way that we, you know, we're hoping for. And and we begin to start doubting and we begin to start wondering if the Lord Lord loves us. And and then we begin stumbling and, and and we start removing our focus from the Lord and onto other things. And next thing you know, we start trying to make deals with ungodly 
unbelievers and, 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 and we start putting our trust in physicians and we start you know, thinking that there's some other answer other than what, the, what, what God has for us. And we forget that God is the one who actually is able to give us the strength that we need to continue fighting the good fight of faith and running the race that's before us. It's possible that you've been struggling to run the race that's been set before you because your spiritual feet aren't working right. And if so, then I encourage you to remember what Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12. It's here in Hebrews 12 where Paul declares, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's the key. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Christian, listen, those of us who fail to continue fixing our focus on Jesus Christ are going to struggle to cross the finish line of faith because our spiritual feet lack the strength that we need to run. And with that being the case, I just want to encourage you in closing to remember that Jesus is the one who can provide us with the endurance that we need. He is the one who can strengthen our feet. He is the one who can en enable us to run the race that he set before us because he is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. Rather than focusing on the wicked rulers of this world who are trying to attack us and rather than creating you know, peace treaties with unbelievers who can't help us, let's instead fix our focus on Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith so that we can finish the race in such a way that will actually bring glory to God as we finish this race well.